Stefan. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, um, my experience turning um, text to speech synthesizers, modifying them in a way to make them usable for music. But I'm not diving directly in. I start by talking about a device which I hope everybody of you brought here today. It was a mandatory prerequisite. The human vocal tract. <laughs> so we start our way from, from the, the bottom up to the top and explore how speech is produced usually. Usually we don't think about how it's produced because it comes naturally to us, but for this, if you want to synthesize speech, it's helpful to know how the vocal tract works. So on the bottom you see the larynx um, containing the vocal cords, which is basically the oscillator feeding the vocal tract. Vocal cords are um, produce sound by muscular activity and airflow, usually a little bit bigger in males, in grown-up males than in females. So females have a higher voice and um, males a, a lower voice in pitch. That's pretty clear, I think. Then we have the oral cavity. Uh, that's very important. We have the lips, the teeth, and most important, the tongue. It's a very flexible organ and much bigger than you think it is. Let's say, uh, um, if you can feel it from here, it's, it extends very much down. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the tongue is one of the most important parts of the vocal tract because you can still talk without teeth or perhaps without lips, but not without the tongue. Or some, some even manage to talk without the, the vocal cords or so. But without the tongues, no way you can speak. So yeah. um, There's a bit more. There's a nasal cavity. I'm not so sure. Is the nasal, I mean, speech comes out of our mouth. I'm not so sure. Do we need the nose? Is it required? for speech production or not? I'm not so sure, so let's just make an experiment. I want you all to, to, to utter mm, and continue. Mm, do it with me, yeah? Now, pinch your nose. <laughs> so wh what happens? It doesn't, it doesn't work, huh? So when we utter an M, mm, this sound actually comes out of our nose. So. M and also N are for names, we come later to what for name is, that are called nasals because they come out of our nose. So the nasal cavity is an important part of the vocal tract. And if we want to uh, model human speech, maybe we have to consider also the nasal cavity. There's another cavity where I think the acoustic properties are not so very important. It's, uh, but it's the brain, of course, the brain control, controls everything here. And, okay, I have a little thing here. So, this is the pink trombone. Maybe some of you already saw it, some smart guy. I don't know what's his, his name, we have to just look it up. Uh, Nick Thapen, he put it up online. And it's a, it's a model of the vocal trap. It, track a functioning model where you can move the tongue and several other, other things. So, for example, here we have an E. e. Can you have it a little bit louder or, or I don't know if you... E. This is an E. This is like an, an A. Ah. Yeah, so you see the this is a vowel, as you know, A, R, and E are vowels, and they differ by the shape of the vocal tract, which results in different formant frequencies. We come to that also later. Um, I'll show you something else. I make continuous pitch on, so, but I close it now here. So, Here we have the hard palate and the soft palate. And I close the lips now, but what you are hearing is an M, like I told you before, because I'm clicking here and I'm causing the lips to close. So if I briefly open and close it, 
Mama. It can say kind of something like Mama or so. Yeah, it continues to say. Yeah. Mama. Well, in, <laughs> incidentally, Mama. yeah. If I do it here, Mama. it's more like Papa. You know, the only difference is here that the velum, which closes, which uh, uh, connects the nasal cavity um, to the throat, is closed. Yeah? So you can feel it yourself. You have the, the hot palate, and that's kind of the roof of your mouth, it goes over to the soft palate and then to the velum, which closes, yeah, which is kind of a switch between throat and nasal cavity. Yeah? So here it says, ma, ma. Papa. Yeah? Ma. So I will turn it off again, back to my presentation, hopefully. So um, this is basically how the human vocal tract works. So yeah, by um, shaping the vocal tract and by, uh, um, by the vocal cords. There are other elements. There's some, some utterances have friction, like sh, s, f. Yeah, some are called fricatives or so, um, where the sound is not uh, caused by the vocal cords, but by um, air turb turbulence or so. Yeah? This has also been taken into respect if you want to synthesize a voice from text or whatever. So what's next? So this is the basic, a very basic, very simplified um, flow, how text is usually converted to speech. There are two, two steps. There are kind of many in between, but well, um, for now, let's say we have a text representation, like here, muddy puddles. And from that, we have to go to a phoneme representation because uh, the relation from text to phonemes is, uh, let me say, it's not very orthogonal. It's kind of, uh, so the, the letters do not map directly to um, the sounds. The phonemes, they are much more related to the sound. So first we have to do the text to phoneme representation and the, from the phonemes we usually go to the audio stage. And there are different methods of doing this. First, let's focus on the audio part, where the phonemes are converted to audio. So we've seen one method, as we have seen in the pink trombone. It's called articulatory synthesis, where you have a kind of a physical model of the vocal tract, which you use. In here, the um, pink trombone or others, like GNU speech, which is a kind of an aban abandoned project that isn't, is kind of dead now. But they use um, a tube resonance model where discrete sections of a tube are, uh, over time, are, sh are changed in diameter and so form different vowels. They are also uh, excited by an oscillator we have a switch for the velum. Also, we have a uh, noise, which we inject at different points in that path, like normal. And although this is quite powerful, as we have seen in the pink trombone, it's not very widely known. At least I'm not aware of any commercial successful speech synthesizer or so that's using that. Well, also, it's also historic, historically, it's interesting. It uh, was developed in the 50s by Kelly and Lochbaum. These tube junctions are still called Kelly Lochbaum jun junctions, I think. But at that time, it was just impossible to make such, so many junctions. So, what people did make, they did ferment synthesizers. This is a basic building block of a um, parallel ferment synthesizer. Parallel because we have an oscillator and a noise source and a switch <clears throat> because we have voice utterances like all the vowels, also um, nasals like N, M, and we have unvoiced or like f, s, sh, where noise is the main carrier element. So we have a switch for them. There exists even uh, some sounds like zh, which are both voiced and uh, um, unvoiced, but let's keep it simple for now. So there's the switch and then there are three formant filters in parallel, and at the end, it's all mixed and goes to the output. 
Of course, those filters are continuously controlled in frequency and amplitude. Also the switch, the oscillator is also controlled in pitch, amplitude, and the noise as well. So this is actually a, a diagram of the um, parallel four month synthesizer as done by uh, John Holmes in 1973. Interesting to note here that the, um, <clears throat> these are kind of the control voltages here. There are uh, three formants. There are nasal antiformants. Uh, these controls, I think these are actually voltages, so this is all analog. You can see here those uh, potentiometers. And what's interesting, you can here see a fourth formant. By the way, does, has everybody understood what a formant is? Yeah? Okay, I, I think with such an audience, I can expect that. So the fourth formant does not change in frequency. It's kind of constant. It only changes in amplitude. So um, for understanding speech, three formants are kind of enough, but the fourth formant just makes it sound a little bit more natural. I think, um, yeah. So this is kind of the phonetic elements for controlling such a very simple speech synthesizer um, where you see, so the time goes from top to the bottom. F0 is usually what's called the, the fundamental frequency. Noise, we have like two, two numbers, it's the, um, amplitude and also here a kind of a frequency, a filter, a, simple, a very simple filter coefficient. And then you have the three formats, each with the formant center frequency and the amplitude. And you can see here clearly how this is, these are phonetic elements. These are not phonemes because cat, the word cat has like three phonemes, but for controlling such a um, formant synthesizer, we need more element, roughly every 10 millisecond one element that controls these, the synthesizer. Either digital or analog, people didn't care so much at that time. The first ones were analog, but then in the 80s or so, it was easier to do them digitally. So as you can see, clearly see it starts with noise. And um, <clears throat> then there's a short period of silence indicated by the zeros there um, so after the K, it's usually, yeah, comes some silence until the glottis sets in and then are these four mans, which are kindly uh, evolving. They are not constant. And at the end, you see here, you have noise again for the T, yeah, until it's kind of, yeah, silence. So there was usually silence before and after, but I skipped that. So, so this is, um, the kind of yeah, phonetic elements, not phonemes, used to control such a four-month synthesizer. I think I have one example. I don't know if uh, it should be. I enjoy the simple life, as long as there's plenty of comfort. Yeah. I enjoy the simple life, as long as there's plenty of comfort. Okay, so th I think this is John Holmes. You heard him twice. It was once a recording of his original voice. And the second was recreated using this synthesizer. Not by, by converting text to speech, but by, well, he took a lot of time to, to tweak the parameters so that it sounded exactly like the original, which was also kind of very band limited, to be honest. Um, so this was the proof of concept that the, the synthesizer here is capable of producing those sounds required for intelligible speech so the main problem was well, not, well, how to do the sequencer, but how to control the sequencer. Yeah. So next is a, a variant of the um, Forman synthesizer made by Dennis Klatt. He said, well, a, a parallel Forman synthesizer is not right because the, um, that's not how the, the vocal track works. So he said, we must have those uh, cascaded. So he made those, a cascade of those formant filters. RNP is like, uh, um, 
resonator for nasal pole, nasal zero, and then he had like uh, those four mans, uh, five four man filters. But in addition, he employed also a, um, a parallel path, which was used for the um, yeah for the, the friction sounds for the no, mainly for the non voiced sounds, because the air turbulence happens. Sometimes at the teeth, at the very front, or so. And um, this cascade model doesn't work like that. You can't just inject um, sound somewhere in this uh, cascade because this is not an articulatory model of the vocal tract. An articulatory model would have also backwards traveling waves. And this only goes for. So he had the, the cascade and the parallel path, which made, which made it quite complex. But this was uh, actually <coughs> quite successful, this CLAT synthesizer. There were several um, embodiments of those called CLAT talk, me talk, uh, deck talk. I don't remember those all. So for history about these, we, we could spend another two hours or so. Um, one most prominent user was um, Stephen Hawking. So he. Unfortunately, he died this year, but he used a clut style synthesizer throughout his life. Also, in the 90s, he was offered a synthesizer that sounded much more natural, but he didn't feel happy with that. So throughout his um, life, he used the speech synthesizer, uh, which was based on the voice of Dennis Clut, who invented this clut style synthesizer. Thermal fluctuations in the very early universe would be frozen in and would cause small differences in the microwave background in different directions. Yeah, that was him. Yeah. So, another method for speech synthesis. So, those are direct synthesis for man synthesis. Um, later, when um, computers came up and uh, memory was kind of cheap, uh, people started using dphones. A dphone is just a succession of two phone names and sequence. And they synthesize the speech by, well, just concatenating them, well, with some fading in, fading out. And that's also the problem with dphone concatenation. Some, it's a lot of work to figure out the proper transitions especially if you want to modify the pitch or so you, to not have phasing effects or whatever. So editing a set of like, um, you can imagine if you have like 43 four names and 43 four names, uh, I, I made it in two axes, and you need the transition from one four name to the other, you have like 43 times 43, like roughly 18, <coughs> 1849 defaults or so. Yeah? That's a lot. Everybody of you who already maintained kind of a sample library of a piano, so it's a tedious work to, to uh, uh, maintain so many samples and get the levels right and so on. So fortunately, we don't need all those dphones. And this is my favorite topic. Has anybody of you heard of phonotactics before? <laughs> it's so cool. So phonotactics are rules for, each language has its phonotactics, how a um, syllable or a single syllable word is formed. So this is like, yeah, a syllable has a, always a vowel and then a, a consonant cluster optional in front and a consonant cluster optional as a coda and there are rules, like, for example, um, the word you starts with a y, but there's no word ending with that. So if you take that into consideration, ah, one thing, you best understand phonotactics if you know, if you look at words that violate this, like this word. Anybody know this word? Anybody knows how to, pronou how to, to, to pronounce it properly? Yeah, so uh, yeah. <clears throat> I don't think anybody in the C++ committee knows about phonotactics. <laughs> 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 so 
Yeah. But if you take this into consideration, um, you will end up with a slightly improved grid where you can see uh, which for name can follow which or so. Huh? They go to the science here. So in the upper left corner, you have uh, vowels, and no vowel follows another vowel. Sometimes they do, but these are called diphthongs, like uh, boy, uh, like oi in, in boy. Yeah. So these are separate. Uh, they are listed here as well. And here are the consonants. Almost every consonant can come before any vowel. There are just some exceptions, like H, like hat. You can start a word with that, but you cannot end a word with that. Well. And then, most interesting, here is the consonants, where in the English language, there are not so many possibilities to, for one consonant to, to come after the other. Now, you'll see the, the S, for example. Well, very often you have a, uh, an S if you build a, a plural, but very often also it's the voiced S. So S comes in two variants, the voiced and the unvoiced. Z and, z, yeah? and depending if you make a plural of a word which ends with the um, voiced consonant or then the voiced S is also used. So this is um, deformed based synthesis. Most of you know this because, well, modern, not the most modern uh, text-to-speech systems work like this. But what you have in your, in, in your phone or so is very likely concatenative synthesis using unit selection. So unit selection works a little bit like a deformed concatenation, only that you have a big corpus of text, of annotated text, and you annotate <coughs> the single for names, the defaults, words, some combinations like I love, or maybe a whole sentence. Yeah? So if your navigation system tells you you have reached your destination, you can be pretty sure that none of this is synthesized, but it's there as a complete sentence. Yeah? Where if you thri drive through Germany with the uh, uh, English navigation system, and it will not be able to properly pronounce the street names, and it will revert to defaults or for names. So, but how, that was kind of the, the audio part. We also need to know how, how do we convert text to for names. This is a list of for names. I think I have to speed up a little bit. So, this is rule-based. This was um, where we have a, a text segment, a left context, a right context, and the resulting for name. So you usually iterate through those rules, see if the context and the, the text matches, and the, then output the for name. This was developed in, the, in 1976. Actually, there were two papers, both published in 1976. Uh, strangely, both mainly by women. Uh, I couldn't, re very similar content, I couldn't really tell which one came, came first, so the, I mentioned them both here. Um, there's dictionary-based uh, conversion. Very nice here, the CMU dictionary, Carnegie Mellon University, this is available for free. You can download it, use it in your app. It's even used in um, apps like Vocaloid, which many of you may know as a, um, yeah, vocal synthesis program. And there you have, well, very easy, your words and then the for name representation. The numbers there are indicating uh, stress. Stress means if a syllable or vowel is, is stressed. There's another not so popular thing, the Moby project. It also has pronunciation things, but also like we have very different word lists um, with the meaning of the word or so, or the hyphenation or so, that also can turn out to be very interesting for speech synthesis. So, and the funny thing is, if you combine dictionary and rule-based pronunciation, well, you have it in both, you have 
some white area that is not covered by them. But they're usually, well, they overlap only in a very tiny area. And so, yeah, this tiny area is where they don't overlap. So usually there should be some words that are not covered by them. But to be honest, with the rule-based uh, system and the dictionary, I couldn't find a single word, including new words, beautiful words like Brexit or so, uh, <laughs> that fit into this tiny white thing. So I think the way they overlap is more like this. The other thing about rule-based text-to-name conversion is if you combine dictionary and rule-based and you have some area that is common to both, which both uh, um, operate very well on, you can just skip, kill the dictionary with that and replace it by the rules. And by doing that, you can kind of compress the whole English uh, pronunciation in like half a megabyte or so. So even for embedded devices, this is uh, quite easy. Okay, we go on. Splish, Splash, Zentralsparkasse. Um, one of these words is not English. <laughs> Which is it? Splish. This is right, yes, because splish, you cannot find it in the CMU dire um, pronunciation directory, but splash is a proper English word, and Zentralsparkasse as well, because it's contained in the CMU dictionary, there's a proper pronunciation of Zentralsparkasse. I can tell you it's not a German word. I think it, it might be Austrian, because there is exactly one Zentralsparkasse in, in the world, and that is in Vienna. Um, so what we have next? OK, let's talk about prosody. Any of you know what prosody is? Yeah? OK, so I give, you, uh, I give you a hint what prosody is. What would you think if I would continue my talk like this? This sounds a little bit robotic because my voice has no melody. Yeah. So the fantastic thing about prosody is this is the inherent melody of our talking. <coughs> so we're not aware of that, but when we are talking, we're constantly improvising the melody for whatever we are saying or so. And for recreating convincing speech, it's very mandatory to have a proper prosody. And this turns out to be much more complex than all the rest. Text to phoneme, phonemes to audio, that's a piece of cake in comparison to proper synthesis of prosodic parameters. So you have the, uh, from the phoneme, you have the, 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 the stress of like stressed syllables, and, but then you have to go from the text and maybe know a little bit about the meaning and uh, this is really very complicated. There's a lot of publications how prosody is generated. One thing is we're not interested in prosody because we want to use text-to-speech for music. So in our case, we are very lucky because when we use it for music, we have a melody and we don't have to care about prosody synthesis. So talking versus singing. There are, of course, you know, talking and singing sound a little bit different. Usually notation looks like this, uh, where every note has a syllable. Sometimes a word is going over two, two notes with two syllables. This is a representation in Vocaloid 5. Yeah. You notice I wasn't able to figure out how to, to properly get the word taking over two notes. So I had to use experimental spelling, like taking, well, which kind of sounds the same. So, <clears throat> but it, is this really the proper representation for this? I took a little audio snippet and annotated that with a metronome. So let's listen to that. One, two, three. Splish, splash, I was taking a bath. Okay, <clears throat> okay. you might wonder why I took this uh, um, uh, snippet. It's interesting because splish or splash has like three consonants in a row, spill, and this is as much as you get in the English language. In German, we have a lot more, I can promise you. Huh? <laughs> 
But um, so let's look what happens here in the, so I think this is the splash. Splish. The splish. splish. Okay, let's zoom in a little bit. Anybody of you know Audacity? I see, you all donated also to the Audacity. Huh? Uh, splish. So here's the metronome you see on, on the bottom, and here you see splish. the word splish. And what's interesting is here we have the consonant part. So we clearly see the consonant cluster precedes the actual beat. So that means a syllable is not on the note, but the, the vowel, the vowel onset of a syllable is, is on the beat, as we see here. So if, if I isolate it here, yeah, it's quite. So, and that's the problem because there are um, software synthesizers who try to recreate speech as plugins, but in order to do so, they would have to know for a, a note event in advance, like more than 200 milliseconds in advance. Uh, so, if we look at this, this whole thing is yeah, 226 milliseconds. I'm not so knowledgeable about audio workstations. Does latency compensation work there reliably so that you can get the node on like two or 300 milliseconds in advance? I'm not so sure if that's a feature, but well, it would be required. So um, that's also why most or many um, speech synthesizers or singing synthesizers have their own timeline. If there are plugins or standalone applications, that doesn't matter. So we go back to the presentation. So, okay. Next, experimental speech synthesis. I have another tiny sample there. Oh yeah, okay. So, make it like full screen, bigger. So, I will first do the, the um, spectrogram representation. So, you clearly can see here the, the formats, yeah? Uh, I will play. You have reached your destination. So you have reached. Yeah, it's, it says something like you have reached your destination. So I'm fantasizing about navigation systems using such a crude voice. <laughs> um, the thing is, uh, here I want to show that you do not necessarily need filters for generating speech. I mean, it's uh, very crude and robotic sounding. But to be honest, I prefer computers to sound robotic and not pretending to be human. You have reached. So, um, actually, if, but let's look at the time domain representation here, the waveforms. Uh, and then we can see, well, let's look here. Oops. So you see, um, it's basically sine waves in succession. So what I used here is just a single sine wave oscillator synchronized to the pitch and in sync with the pitch modulated in amplitude and frequency. That's as simple as you can get, but you still can get some kind of, um, yeah, a little bit intelligible uh, speech. So it doesn't have to be very complicated. It can be simple as hell. Okay, back to the vocal tract. One other idea I once had, what happens if we cut above the larynx? Don't try this at home. Uh, <laughs> um, the idea is to have replaced the source here by something other, maybe a synthesizer or so, yeah? So we go to this representation, which is a little bit more friendly. So if we cut here the oscillator and instead use a synthesizer, would that be possible to do that? Or why hasn't anyone done this before? So I did this, and I called it the phrase vocoder. Anybody of you heard about the phrase vocoder? Okay, you're sure you don't mean the face vocoder, yeah? yeah okay. So um, this was, I released it like three years ago. It was not very popular. Maybe it was because it was hidden deep in the effects section of a uh, uh, of an app 
that was supposed to be a drum synthesizer. It was kind of a horrible, <laughs> <laughs> horrible user interface. Yeah. Uh, but I had fun, and it's, um, so let's zoom this in a little bit. Maybe we can hear a little, don't worry, what we will hear will just be a few seconds. So, okay, so that was, <laughs> thank you. So that was a um, voice made by these uh, um, phrase for code. And I made it simple. I like it to be simple. So it only has like yeah, a text field and basically like four controls. So you can see Q, this is basically the, the resonance for the formants. You can tweak it a little bit to, to get more intelligibility. And his is where well, depending on your source, you might um, change the volume of the uh, injected noise for the so for the non-voiced um, utterances. Gender is interesting uh, here. I can change the uh, formats up or down, not in a linear fashion or so, but I try to figure out a way so they don't move in the in the same percentage or so. But I um, try to find a way that they sound quite right. So very male to the left, very female to the right. So yeah. um, speed, that's also kind of uh, interesting, uh, is the ratio of consonants versus vowels. Because in singing, the vowels are kind of the most important part. So we sing that's what, what, the sing, what carries the singing. And the consonants are kind of in the way. And we are, when we sing, we squeeze them a little bit so they don't get in the way of the sound. So here you can adjust the speed. If you turn it up very fast, you can hardly hear the consonants because they are so uh, compressed so tightly together. Whereas if you make it very slow, you can have like an effect where it's kind of talking. So with this phrase vocoder, you could also do stupid things. Um, this is just a pick, yeah? Okay, but, but I could also like take this as a carrier signal or so, and then... Uh, I am Maddy Butter, yeah! <laughs> yeah, so, um, yeah, okay, I, I think I never grow up. Um, <laughs> so uh, this is what you, you can do with that or so. Huh? And I find it quite fascinating. So, which brings me to kind of the last part. I will briefly uh, go through some available um, singing synthesizers. Also, one human, this is Bobby Darin. Uh, he performed the Splish Splash song uh, I subjected you to. Died much too young, or so, yeah. Um, you'll see is actually not uh, uh, um, a text-to-speech system, but I like this program very much, and um, it sounds kind of cool, and I think it's kind of expressive, so I included this here. Yeah. It's from a cool Swedish company, Clef Grant, I saw nobody of that company here? Oh, okay, Chip Speech. Chip Speech is actually, anybody of know, you know Chip Speech? This is a very cool software from a company called Ploke in Canada, and they are recreating historic TTS systems, but in a way that they can also like sing, or you, you can use them in a musical context. And he has recreated like 10 or maybe even more um, historic speech synthesizers, like um, yeah, CLUT synthesizers, or uh, also deform-based synthesizers, different format synthesizers, LPC-based, linear predictive coding, which is more a way of compressing speech or so. And it uh, just sounds fascinating. It's one of the few softwares I actually bought. Well, the phrase vocoder, that's what I made, and also a contestant Vocaloid. So I have to play something here and then Say okay, quickly and then quickly go back to this. So, what's happening here? 
Okay. One, two, three. So, this is Bobby Darren. This is a... Splish splash, I was taking a bath. Okay, <laughs> so that was a very short song contest, or so um didn't want to steal my yeah. I was a little bit worried about Chris because it was advertised as a male voice, but it really didn't sound very male to me, to be honest or so. Yeah. So last part, I want you to briefly well, judge the contestants. For this, I made a kind of a diagram here. And so you see on the lower axis we have the intelligibility. Could you actually understand what was, what was said from a question mark to an exclamation mark? Uh, the other scale is expressivity. Expressivity, is that a word? I don't know. Uh, so, yeah. So for this, what could better represent expressivity as the wonderful seaboard from our host, Roly? Yeah, this is the epitome of uh, expressivity. Isn't it right? Is that enough for my juice license? <laughs> okay, so, okay, first we take Bobby Darin. I think he was quite intelligible. How expressive was he? Say, yeah for up or say boo for down? Okay, I, I, okay, it was kind of, so. Juicy, was he intelligible? No. no. Was he expressive? No, okay, yeah, yeah, so a little bit. Yeah. What about ship speech? W was he quite intelligible or not so? Yeah, okay, so we put him kind of in the intel. Was he expressive or not so? No. Okay, we put him kind of here. I didn't rehearse that. I have no idea what, what the outcome. So phrase for coder, was it intelligible or not? You can say, say it, I mean. <laughs> I don't mind. Uh, you can say it sounded like crap. It's very expressive. It's scary. It's scary. So, so very expressive, but intelligible or not? No. Okay, but I think it was a little bit more intelligible than you see, or? Okay, please. <laughs> so was it more expressive than you see or not? Okay, I'm surprised. Yeah. Vocaloid. Was it intelligible? Yes. More than ship speech or less? More than the original? Okay, that's, in, that's interesting. <laughs> so, uh, how expressive was, was Vocaloid? Not much, I hear. So, more or less expressive than ship speech? More expressive than ship speech? Okay, I was surprised about that also. Okay, I put him like kind of here. Okay. So, okay. I, I was expecting something different or so, yeah, but. Uh, I was expecting more uh, kind of a line where you see, well, they are either expressive or intelligible. Huh? But um, <clears throat> you see, um, so I think humans are still a little bit better at singing than machines. <laughs> yeah? Well, we can have tremendous fun making machines sing. And also, uh, in the recent past, there's a lot of music where um, engineers spend a lot of energy making human sound, sounds more robotic, like um, Cher, who started with this whole uh, a madness with autotune, and Daft Punk or so. Yeah. So I think um, speech synthesis and music is a topic that has not been, um, yeah, it's a little bit, Underdeveloped, if you can, th there's so much fun that you can have with that, and I think um, this is an area where <clears throat> we can expect a little bit more creative products to happen. Also, if not from you, then from me. So, <laughs> this kind of uh, concludes my talk. If you have any questions or so, now would be the proper time to ask.
All right, we've got time for some questions. Who would like to kick us off? I, uh, hello. I'd like to play with the phrase for Kodor. So wh what's the name of the drum synth where it's, it's hidden? It's from Waldorf. It's the Waldorf uh, Attack Drums app. So, yeah. So. Thanks. Yeah. The, the pink trombone uh, looks like a more accurate physical model of a vocal track. Why, why is this system or never become popular? Yeah. Um, that's a good question. So, um, like I said, these um, Kelly Lochbaum thing with the, the connected tubes was it developed in the 50s, and at that time it was just not possible to, uh, they tried this, I think, with electronics or so, but it was just too complicated. So the formant-based things, I think they, they were a little bit easier to make analog and then digital. Yeah? And later, with D-phone uh, concatenation, that sounded so natural that nobody really bothered to use the tube resonance model anymore. Uh, but I think there's still a lot of um, potential in that. Yeah? And um, it's actually not so complicated to m modify a, a, a system where you have the phonemic, the phonetic element to control such an articulatory vocal tract. Because if once you have such an, uh, a vocal tract, it's kind of easy to modify it to have a, a, a longer or, or shorter uh, tube for, for males or females or even pigs or so. Yeah. Hi. Um, I think you mentioned um, one very important uh, um, issue that is the relation with digital out workstations between plugins and workstations. Yeah. Um, because uh, I've created the, the text to sync engine of East West Choir product, and we have the same issue, uh, same issues regarding that. Because sometimes you need to get information not only for the past but also in the future. Because if you are, especially not a lot with instruments, but with voice and especially with yeah. text, if you know how long it takes before you end this note and the beginning of the next note, and you still have some consonants to get there, you need to accelerate them or eventually make yeah. them more. And the one of the issues that we had with the product was, okay, how can we get this kind of information? It, and there wasn't a way for us to get the upcoming notes. And what we have to do is to have almost like a rehearsal kind of uh, approach. Yeah. So essentially you play the entire track one time to actually get the timings right and then the next times it's going to uh, sound much better so yeah. if people from digital wild workstations are listening so okay let's mm. start working on some way for us to get the upcoming notes and or eventually get the notes yeah. a little before to be able to get the most of the yeah. systems. Yeah. Th that's a very good point yeah I, I also wish um, latency compensation would not only work for effects but also for uh, uh, synthesizers or maybe have explicit lyric tracks for vocal synthesis or so. Um, this is also one of the reasons I embedded the phrase for code in a drum synthesizer because there I had my own timeline and I knew in advance when the next uh, a phrase or a phoneme would come so I, can, I uh, made it so that it's not perhaps not so intelligible but it's at least properly in time with having the, the onset on the vowel part of the syllables and not on the uh, um, consonants. Yeah. Actually, some additional information, one of the things that we have learned was that on the beginning when we released that, and essentially this is for choir and symphonic choirs, yeah. uh, what we realized that was people were having a lot of fun having a symphonic choir singing dirty words. Uh, <laughs> I can imagine, yeah. I think the I, I think, uh, uh, interesting thing is the Vocaloid license uh, forbids using dirty words and uh, <laughs> publishing things with it. So, uh, yeah, yeah. But um, for example, the, the, the uh, chip speech software does not have its own timeline. So, in order to get properly uh, uh, timed things, you have to fiddle a little bit and shift the notes around a little bit manually uh, to get your desired result or so. Uh, but it's awesome anyway, this software. I think we have time for one more quick question. Anybody? Okay. 
Uh, you mentioned in the Vocaloid 5 stuff, uh, some Japanese uh, vocal cre uh, composers are uh, using some different synth speech synthesizer called Utao, and they are using something called tr uh, something like triphone stuff. Have you heard of that? Or is uh, it? Yeah, I, I heard about triphones. Triphones is just uh, um, like dphones on steroids. So instead of having a, a two times two matrix where uh, each phone, you have to figure out which for name can come after what you have like a, a, a three-dimensional thing where you, um, so it really blows up your the required um, uh, arsenal of utterances very much but it might sound better using triphones yeah they say so so i was yeah. just wondering if it's like so. Japanese specific or English yeah. uh, that would I don't know. I, I also thought I, I'm not a Japanese. I'm not very, very familiar with the Japanese language. But uh, listening to Hatsune Miku, you know, you know about her. Yeah. Anybody knows about Hatsune Miku? Uh, it's a kind of a manga figure, and she even give, gives concerts taught by Vocaloid. So I had the impression that the uh, Japanese language is maybe better suited for speech synthesis as the English language because. Um, there is a closer relation from writing, from text, yeah. to, to phonemes or so than in English. I don't yeah. know. Yeah. OK. We have to wrap it up there. Let's all thank Stefan one more time. <laughs>